From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more Corner Pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. What is up, everybody? It is Wake Up War Champ, presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, Renegade Express Mailback. Questions about this offense, just how potent can it be? And shades of 2013 coming up, question mark? Wake Up War Champs, presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill in Tallahassee, Florida. Weekday lunch specials, Monday through Friday. That's weekdays, kids. 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. for only $8.99. On Wednesdays, get yourself a five-piece chicken wing and french fry. The best wings in town, many would say. The smart, the educated would say. Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida, 2475 Appalachian Parkway. You can always check out the website, cptallybar.com. You can also hit that QR code on your screen. takes you right to the website. Easy peasy, as some might say. Warchant.com is your ultimate symbol sports source. Six months of access for 30 American dollars. Take advantage. Hit the thumbs up. Leave a a five-star rating and review. And don't forget, tune in later tonight. Or today, I guess. Six o'clock doesn't really feel like tonight. Sun's still up most everywhere, right? Across the country still, Corey? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Live show. Corey Clark, myself. Live Wake Up Board Chant. Presented by Corner Pocket Bar Grill and Vitamin Energy. 6 p.m. Tune in, everybody. That'll be your Thursday podcast as well. Corey, how are you, friend? I'm good, buddy. I'm good. A little disappointed in the FSU women's golf team. Mm. Kind of gave it away there in the uh, first round of match play. They made the final eight, though, so they finished top eight. Still a great year, but... They had a real chance to win a national title, and they kind of fell apart there in the last few holes. So one of these days, one of these sports that's always hovering around it, Aslan. Mm. And you know who you are, folks. I'm talking about men's golf. I'm talking about women's golf. I'm talking probably especially about beach volleyball. Mm. We got to get you to the promised land one of these times. You hover around it. You give yourself enough chances. You're knocking on the door. You're finishing top eight, top four. One of these times is going to need him to break through and win the whole thing. Yeah. Like soccer on. and softball have. Yeah. Just get, go to the Plex, y'all. Hang out the Plex. Mm. Take notes. Good things are bound to happen. I trust everybody's well out there. I don't think there's been anything too, uh, you know, current affairs-ish that we need to talk about. So let's just dive to the mailbag. By the way, actually, the Super Regional will be Thursday, Friday, if needed, Saturday. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't matter because it's sold out. So if you don't have a ticket, tough. It sold out in one minute, which is awesome. Again, like Lonnie said, it shows the great uh, excitement for this this team and from this fan base, but also maybe build some more bleachers or figure out a way to house more people and get some more money out of this. Yeah. Uh, we start off with random underscore John. Uh, I'm just going to cut through the uh, through the the flowery verbiage in here. Uh, basically, adding Keon Coleman, uh, nothing short of mind blowing. Do you foresee this? influencing the way I guess our defense will play, especially when it comes to having to strengthen the safety position. And what do you think the staff is doing to get some real season depth and not just another guy? Uh, If we were to not bolster the safety position with experienced depth, how could we manage to keep LSU score under 24? Uh, I'm not scared. Fine. They can score 26. I still think if if LSU scores 26, I feel good. Yeah, I agree with you. It's certainly going to be a game. Uh, and I would think if LSU scores 26, they will probably lose that game. Uh, not predicting anything, not making a score prediction, but I would think uh, Florida State will be in the 30s. It should be in the 30s in every game they play. Um, yeah, I, I think with – with we talked about this on headlines on Tuesday. Uh, I, I think with Coleman, you, you go from having what you knew was going to be a prolific offense to maybe the best offense in the country. And I don't know that it changes the way your defense plays – but I think it changes maybe the way uh, teams a- approach their games with you because they know you're going to score. So maybe they go for it a little more on fourth down because they know your team is going to go down the field and score. So if it's fourth and three at their own 47, they might go for it now because if they give the ball to you, whether they give you the ball at the 19-yard line or, or the seven-yard line or right at their own 43, they have a good idea that you're going to move the ball and probably be in a position to go score. So I think it might change the way teams – coach against you and play against you. And also, uh, uh, Jeff and I are brought up a good point about, well, I don't even know who brought up the point. I can't remember. But the 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 the, the tact that most teams will take, and I assume LSU will be this way too, is let's try to run the ball. Let's grind some clock. 
and keep that offense on the sidelines, keep that Florida State offense off the field. Mm-hmm. Well, if you've got Braden Fisk, Fabian Lovett, uh, Daryl Jackson, Josh Farmer, like it's good luck. I mean, you might be able to run the ball. They're, they're, I mean, I'm not saying this is the steel curtain necessarily, but Florida State should be much harder to run the ball on than they were most of the time last year. Remember, Florida ran the ball on them. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma ran the ball on them. Uh, Louisville ran the ball on them. All the teams that they struggled, NC State, uh, didn't even complete a pass in the second half, I don't think. They they were able to run up the middle on Florida State. Uh, that will not be the case this year if they're healthy. So that should help. All right. Uh, keeping in with this great offense, WAC169 is saying uh, thanks for the pods. Makes everyone's work commute much easier. You're welcome. You are welcome. Question, are either of you concerned about having too many offensive weapons and keeping everybody happy? I just hope everyone keeps pulling in the same direction. Go Knowles. Not really, no, because uh, I, I just I think they'll all – you know, Keon Coleman can't imagine that he's coming here to catch the 80 passes. He just has to know. He look. He can look at a stat sheet. He can look at film. I mean, we were Jordan Travis in that Miami game where they won forty-five to three. Jordan Travis completed ten passes, so he knows he's not going to like nineteen eighty-nine BYU. He knows he's going to a place that might only throw the ball twenty-five or thirty times. So I, I think you can keep everybody happy. I think um, none of these guys have accomplished enough to be like, "Where's mine? I need mine." Uh, and also. If their if their goal is to make the league, and I'm talking maybe specifically about like Trey Benson, mm-hmm. you don't want as many miles on your legs as the Alabama starting running back. You know, you want to be fresher when you get to the league. Your career will last longer. So I think it could possibly be a good thing in, in regards to the running backs. And then the receivers know, you know, they might only catch four balls a game, but it could be four for ninety or four for 120. Who knows? Uh, but yeah. Oh, and going back, I don't know what the to the first question. Don't know about the safety position. Um, I think we've been told that they're certainly looking for another uh, capable body at that position, but we don't. I don't have any inside info on who that will be or when that will happen. But grad transfers will start hitting the market here soon, I would think. Yeah, or yeah, because yeah, that's the only way you can actually enter the portal because. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that part of it has been closed. But the guys that already announced, they're out there. But I think when we look at that available list, it's nobody that's really jumping out to you. And I think I haven't really seen any updates on the kid from Louisiana Lafayette who was possibly in the mix there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to be overly concerned with the defensive back when you know how good your offense is going to be. But it is a concern. I I haven't forgotten about it. But I'm not, not losing sleep over it any longer. So that might be my fault, though. Carrying on, we go to Noel Boy 2 Wake up, Aslan and Coracle. I saw a post on the Tribal Council the other day from Mythbusta. Question asked, who was the most underutilized player in FSU history? Many different answers, but I believe EJ Manuel is the answer. What do you guys think? Thanks for answering the question. Go softball, football, golf. Go to Corner Pocket. Go War Chant. Let's go far away from the ACC. And lastly, go Knowles. Most underutilized. That was the word? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, EJ did start for like three and a half years. I get what you're saying, that maybe his athletic talents were exploited and used like they should have been. Um, because he was, when you watch that Clemson game from 12, when he's running, he's fast and he's enormous. But that just, he never was, and I use this comparison because of their body size. They nothing else, I promise. He never wanted to be a Cam Newton type Hmm. that would run 23 times for 190 yards. And quite frankly, he wasn't the runner that Cam Newton was. That's he was Cam Newton was of a different planet. But, you know, I can see Florida State fans wishing he had been more what multidimensional, I guess. But I mean, he did start for three years and he won an Orange Bowl. So it's not like he was uh, he was chopped liver or anything. It's like, do we have to go to the Jeff Bowden era to figure this out? Like uh, like Leon to a certain degree maybe yeah that's because a good one we really tried to get Lorenzo Booker involved and I was like well this guy and I'm guilty of it too you know I saw the rating and I'm like man just let let him eat man let him cook yeah um, no it was pretty obvious Leon was special uh, yeah I'd say Leon Leon's a very good one um, Tamori and Terry having a red shirt you know and well, some other guys yeah. in front of him yeah that was pretty crazy Auden Tate of- we didn't get a lot of out of Auden Tate. Got like one year out of Auden Tate, really. 
Yeah, um, but he didn't – like I was thinking more of like uh, Lavernius Coles, like yeah. somebody that was obviously much better than Florida State fans realized at the time. Like who knew the actual better NFL player that got – uh, that was busted at Dillard's that day was the other guy and not Peter Warwick. But that was the truth. I also think Javon Walker, mm. um, who was a first round pick and had a couple really good years with the Broncos. He only really played one good season at Florida state cause he sprained his ankle his first year, but it wasn't that he was underutilized. He just got hurt, which was a bummer. But I mean, look, man, it's Florida state. There's a million of them. Uh, they're, they're, especially in the nineties, the nineties and early two thousands, there were guys that were just, really good that for whatever reasons um, yeah, he might have had good careers or okay careers that could have been extra special. But Lavernius is the one because he was like an all pro. Like he turned out to be a really good NFL receiver. And at Florida State, he started as a running back and then was kind of an afterthought and became kind of a sacrifice to the, uh, to the I guess, the president for, for the Dillard scandal. So Peter Wart could stay on the team. We're like, we'll get rid of uh, his nickname actually was trouble, which was ironic. Uh, we'll get rid of trouble, but Peter Warwick's going to stay. It was like, well, Lavernius Coles was pretty darn good too. So, yeah. and Randy Moss is always the, yeah. he was clearly the most underutilized of great players that came to Florida state. What about Antonio Cromartie? He was going to be Travis Hunter before Travis Hunter, you know? Yeah. I just think he was going to be, you. it was just that injury, right? Yeah. Like I think they were going to play him on offense that year. He was going to return kicks. I, I think he was, he played a lot his second year and was, a, was about to be a star his third year and got hurt anecdotal post from Smackham. I was talking to a diehard Alabama fan. He did not even know who key was or that he had signed with Alabama. Huh. I fear key has been led down a primrose path to bench sitting. Apparently they don't feel a real need for him. Insurance only in case of disaster. I remember my dad, this was, we were driving to the 2000 Florida game. And if you remember that time, we drove by the Capitol. Mm. It's when the uh, recount was going on. Oh, yeah. Tallahassee was nutso. It was insane. But I remember driving to the Florida game, and this was just like late November. And my dad going, Florida State just got a commitment. For, he didn't know how to pronounce the name. Craponzo. That he, can you believe that that's the guy's name? And I'm like, Dad, I'm pretty sure it's Crafonzo. Mm. But, yeah, he's supposed to be really good. And – that, again, I the, the point I bring up is when you're always awesome, like Alabama is, even if you're a diehard fan, you just assume whoever commits to you is going to be awesome and good. And you, I don't know that Alabama fans live and die with every announcement because they know they're going to get theirs, mm-hmm. right? They know when they show up in August and sprint to the Nick Saban's autograph booth with, with you know, potato chips – Dr. Pepper flying everywhere when they sprint and get in front of that booth that they know that he's put together a roster that will be probably the most talented in the country. So it's a pretty, I guess it's pretty freeing in that way, right? Yeah. Like like it used to be for Florida state fans. And I know recruiting in 2000 wasn't the same. It is in 2023, but I think back then, even when I was a Florida state fan, a diehard, I didn't really keep up with the recruiting because I just assumed if they signed with Florida state, they were awesome, and they're going to be really good. I like that. That was an anecdotal post, and we answered mm. some anecdotal uh, stories. Go. Great. That's what How we do on this show, man. That's why it's the best in the best in the world. Uh, we go to our guy, Daryl, Thomasville, North Carolina, Captain D underscore 63. Uh, did you see SEC Big Mouth Paul Feinbaum claimed that FSU and Clemson, to a lesser degree, are not as attractive of a fit to the SEC as the fan base thinks they are because of the University of Florida? Yeah, did you see these comments? Uh, I think on three did a breakout story. Basically, this argument, and you know, I don't know if he's just talking about carriage fees, carriage fees. I'm sorry that these conferences get with their TV deals, and you want to be in these markets, which is what the ACC try to do by getting into Boston and New York yeah, with Syracuse man. and BC. And it just rained money yeah. when they went to Boston, a famous college loving town like yeah. Boston. Feinbaum's whole thing was. He kept saying in that part of the world, which is funny. But he said that Clemson really, you know, outside of the the two titles they've had, they don't bring a lot to the table, and they don't. They already have a footprint in that part of the world. And then he said basically the same at Florida State. Just I don't think Florida State is nearly as valuable as their fans think because there's already the University of Florida there. So basically, he's just I guess fine bombs looking at realignment as like risk, right? I guess you just want to capture as much territory as you possibly can, and why overlap? To which I would leave it open to you, Corey. Why would you overlap? Why Why would you add Florida State when you already have the University of Florida? 
Well, look, if the Big Ten didn't exist, I would. It, what Feinbaum said isn't outrageous. I mean, it's true. They already do have a footprint in Florida. They have the state school of Florida, which is as popular as Florida State. So, uh, uh, you know, we can argue semantics about ratings, but we all know that Florida and Florida State are close. But what the – and I, I brought – again, I always do this, but I'm going to say what I said on headlines. Just so I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm acting as if this is a brand new thing that I'm saying when I said it on headlines. Um, but – it's it, you hear these athletes that talk about they hate losing more than they love winning. Yeah, it's me. You hear that? You hear that all the time. Well, yeah. the SEC would hate Florida State in the Big Ten more than they would love Florida State in the SEC. Nice. If that makes sense. Absolutely, I follow. But that's what I think gets Florida State to the SEC, and I've said it since all this started: is that the Big Ten really wants a Florida footprint because they are not. They do not have a Florida footprint. And Florida State would be an enormous deal to the Big Ten, which then makes Florida State an enormous deal to the SEC. That's that. That's my point. Yes, if every if the Big Ten didn't exist and they weren't trying to be competitive with the SEC, then the SEC could be like, well, yeah, this is overlap. We do have a, a Florida school already. We already have that state taken care of. Okay, well, then do you want them to go to the Big Ten? Because now the Big Ten has L.A., Miami, Florida State, Clemson, all these big schools in the middle of the country, and they have really – they are going to be on par with us from a football standpoint. And the SEC will be like, well, no, we don't want that necessarily. So I think that's how you get in the SEC. Hmm. Or, or maybe they end up in the Big Ten. I don't know. But they'll, they, they will end up somewhere at some point because they are a very attractive – they are much more attractive to the Big Ten right now than they would be to the SEC, right? That just yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But, again, I think the SEC would rather keep them from the Big Ten. That's if, why they would become attractive. And, and the weird also kind of thing from Feinbaum's comments, was he made it almost sound like Miami was the better option. Like, and he wasn't all that into that, uh, into Miami either, but it was just saying if you're going to look at footprint, at least Miami's in a part of that state that's completely, you know, different than what you have in Gainesville and Tallahassee. And it's like, well, I mean, you feel like you're kind of, you know, trying to conflate some things there at that point, Paul. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> What's he trying to say there exactly? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Daryl also is asking uh, any concerns about Georgia or Florida possibly blocking uh, the path to the SEC. No, I mean, look, Texas got in when Texas A&M clearly didn't want that. I, I think that ship has sailed. I think, again, when you make the point, like I just said, that we don't want our biggest competitor, our only real competitor, uh, the, to have Florida State and Clemson they want to come here. Let's give them a landing spot. Otherwise, we're going to have to be going up against them, competing with them for ratings, championships, and everything else. And Florida State with Big Ten money, Clemson with Big Ten money, should scare the bejesus out of other teams in the SEC. So I would think that would be enough where, where they're not going to block. And it takes more than two to block anyway. But I even if they did, I think the, the majority of the SEC would pass it if it came to that. VitaminEnergy.com, promo code is WarChampBogo, B-O-G-O. Get an item of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. Try out the variety pack if you don't know exactly what you want. There's so many different formulas out there to try. Helps out your mood, your immune system. Shoot, you can get 14,000% of your daily allowance of B12 in just one shot. It's not even two full ounces. Now, can your body, Corey, absorb 14,000% of its B12 daily allowance? I don't know. But it's not a bad thing to have, right? It's a luxury almost. Like, do you need another five-star wide receiver, a uh, mm. guy that caught for like 900 yards almost? Maybe not, but it's not a bad thing. So check Can't it hurt. out. Can't hurt. Can't hurt, right? Can't hurt, exactly. Yeah. Use that promo code WARCHAMBOGO, B-O-G-O. That's courtesy of our friends over at Vitamin Energy uh, that are Florida State alums, including a two-sport former athlete uh, from Florida State. So shake it and take it, everybody. Energy lasts up to seven hours. Tastes great. No sugar crash. Different kinds of vitamins that get your day going the right way you need it to. VitaminEnergy.com. Again, promo code is WarChantBogo. Picking it back up, Corey Clark. Let's go to Nocturnal Knoll. We'll bundle this one. We're going to go back to 2013 a little bit. We're going to talk to our guy Nocturnal Knoll as well as Norvell to the Natty. So these are 2013 questions. Nocturnal Knoll was saying, I've been frequently listening to the Jeff Cameron show. Uh, he mentioned... At one point during the 13th season, he realized it was time for the revenge tour 
across the ACC. Do you feel that way about this season? If not, what would signify to you that we are in revenge mode? And then Norvell to the Natty says, the high expectations for this season, drawing comparisons to 2013, uh, but people say chill out. Uh, there weren't as many stars, weren't as talented as the 13 squad, but did we know how much NFL talent was on that roster before they went and won the whole thing? Is it possible we could be looking at the comparison as being reasonable if they were to go and win the national title? Oh, that's a huge if. Well, not yeah, that well, huge, but it's, yeah. Uh, uh, well, look, man, we all knew Jameis was talented, but nobody knew he was that. Uh, Kelvin Benjamin had been basically potential for, for a year and a half and never really blossomed. Kenny Shaw was, uh, you know, just a, a good college a, a, receiver. Good college average, receiver. I mean, he wasn't even, but Greg Dent was, was, was starting ahead of him the year before. Um, and so he wasn't, he wasn't, he had not proven to be anything special yet. He was just a solid guy. And then Rashad was the one you knew was, was had a chance to be awesome. And O'Leary too, but even O'Leary hadn't really come into his own. So the, and Freeman and Wilder hadn't. So, because Chris Thompson was the guy the year before until he got hurt, and then Freeman started. But Freeman wasn't all that great in twelve until the job became his, really kind of out of default because Chris Thompson got hurt. So when you look at it like that, yeah, there were a lot of question marks. We knew these guys were good; they had a bunch of stars by their names when they were in high school, but none of them had really done anything extra special at the college level, including that offensive line, until the season started. Um, so with that in mind, I would say you could look at this team with Jaheim Bell and Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman and the running backs and be like, okay, well, there's probably actually more proven. These are more proven commodities. I'm not going to say they're more proven talent because I'm not saying Johnny Wilson is not Kelvin Benjamin at peak efficiency. Kelvin Benjamin was out of this world. Um, Keon Coleman probably isn't Rashad Green. But when you look at it in the totality, I would say the you know what you have more with this team than you did with that team going into that season. It just turned out that, you know, Jameis was an all-time quarterback. Um, and your co- Jordan Travis is good. He's not Jameis. But anyway, so, I mean, I don't know. I, I think this offense, it's not going to be 2013, but it should be really darn good. And it's got a lot of guys that have gained a lot of yards and scored a lot of points at the college level, which is a good way to go into a season. And then the revenge tour, man, I don't care. You you beat half the teams you played last year senseless anyway. Hmm. I want you to beat Wake Forest by 100. I, I, I know I should sit here and say beat them by a point because you never beat them anymore. Just sneak up, block an extra point at the end to win that game. Whatever it takes to exercise that demon deacon, do it. But by God, go up to Winston-Salem and beat them by 30 or 40 points. Come on, man. That's when you knew that 13 was special in my book. Forget the Clemson game. Forget everything else. Forget Pitt. It's when you went up to Winston-Salem and had like six interceptions and scored defensive touchdowns on back-to-back plays and just beat the snot out of them. Get back to that. That's what I want to see, Aslan. Beat Clemson. Beat Clemson. Be comfortable in the fourth quarter. Beat Clemson. Okay, that, sure. that would signal to me that the revenge tour is on. You'll play them again in Charlotte. Oh. Beat Wake Forest. Okay. But I don't Please. want to wait till October 28th, though. That's a long oh, wait. Oh, is that when they play Wake? Yeah. Oh, I don't know why I thought that was in September, too. All right, you're right. You're right. Get get rid of Clemson. Get, get, stop that streak. And then, uh, yeah, then start. Really, that's when the official, that's like the opening opening concert of the tour. Hmm. That's like the big one at uh, Madison Square Garden or Doak. Can we not get Doak to have concerts, Aslan? Gainesville hosted Garth Brooks a few years ago. Oh, yeah. Dope just doesn't have rock concerts, just not allowed, can't happen. I mean, why couldn't Taylor Swift have done a show here, right? Or three. Yeah. Why not, Aslan? It, it, tell me. I, I bet know. it would have sold out. Would have been good for the economy. You've got an 80, 75,000 seat stadium that just basically sits empty for every for 358 days a year. Sad when you think about it that just, way. Golly. Just throwing it out there. Jeez, yeah, maybe they do need to make the attendance smaller, make this footprint smaller. Um, FSU Robert. This is going to be a weird question outside of our wheelhouse, but let's do it. They're a subscriber, everybody. You can ask what you want when you subscribe and you pay our uh, Amen. You know, pay our bills. Wake up. I've mentioned this on the board, so fellow listeners, please forgive the redundancy if you've read this, but what are y'all's thoughts on streaming? What if conferences took production and broadcasting in-house 
via their own streaming services and cut out the middleman on ad revenue. Other posters have said this is not practical, but I can't believe there isn't enough money there for it to be worth a look. We've consumed sports basically the same way for so long. Is anyone in the sports world seeing or discussing total disruption? It seems the only leverage networks and now third-party streaming services have ever had is their role as a medium. That's not true anymore. Both of you are awesome. Thanks as always. Go Knowles. Hey, thanks. That's probably a question that's above our pay grade yeah. and intellect at the moment. Uh, I don't not- like stream. I know this is a part of his question, so I apologize, Corey. Um, I don't like streaming, man. Like the the softball yeah. games were on ESPN Plus. Yep. And I was actually able to watch it, even though I don't have an ESPN Plus subscription, so I don't even know how that happened. But anyways, like I was watching the golf. I was watching the PGA Championship. But to be able to watch ESPN Plus on my TV, and I've got Xfinity, I've got to speak it to my remote controller, and i got to go to ESPN3.com on my television. I have to then, on a just a numerical remote controller, toggle over onto a looking glass icon, hit enter, <laughs> type in FSU, hit enter, yeah. look at everything that's for FSU, and then I, I have to pick that game takes a few seconds for it to buffer but then guess what maybe i want to go check it on the pga championship i have to exit the entire espn3 interface to watch a pga championship and if i want to go back and check the softball game i've got to do it all over again i have no idea how you guys watch football on saturdays and stream no it's clue crazy. you it's must crazy. have nine television screens that's the only way i can enjoy it I, I so get, i don't like if streaming. i were you i'd get an ipad it's easier to stream on an ipad and then so i was watching um I actually I had a reverse. I think. But what? Like, you, do you do you broadcast it? Do you mirror it? No, from no. Your I, iPad so if I'm wanting to watch screen? two things at once, like I was watching the PGA Championship on my iPad, I think, as I had the FSU softball game on TV, because it actually did switch over. At least up here, it was on the ACC network. The last five right, yeah, of that no, championship. Right. Yeah. No. It did. It did that as well. So I was watching that on my big TV, and then the PGA Championship on my iPad next to me. But yeah, I get it, man. I'm I've never been a fan of streaming. I've never been a fan of worrying about the signal stopping and buffering and everything else. Um, I'm all about uh, you know cable. I, I still live that cable life. I'm yes, still connected. Sir. I haven't yes, cut sir. the cord. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I know that there was talk, or at least I read a I read a headline. I shouldn't say I read a story because I didn't. It might have even been a tweet um, about the SEC network maybe going to that sort of model where it's basically pay for it. It's not just included necessarily in a bundle. Anybody that wants to, the SEC network has to pay monthly for it, like it's a uh, Netflix or a uh, whatever else. Um, that would be interesting. That's an interesting model. I don't think the ACC has that kind of fandom that it would make its money back doing that. Maybe the SEC would. Um, but, I, man, look, who knows what the future is? You know, I, I literally don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like in 2030. It's Imagine, just think about how much it's changed, Aslan, in like the last 12 years. Just oh, yeah. the way we, the way we, um, you know, take in and take in our entertainment now. From the last, I think, 12 years ago, Netflix was still mailing out movies. Yeah, I think and so. now look at it. Look how much has changed in 12 years. I have to figure by 2030 or 2035, it's going to look a whole lot different than it does now. So who knows where it's going? But I'm sure that's a possibility, and I'm sure streaming will be involved somehow. But I don't know how, and I'm not smart enough. It's not my area of expertise, if I even have one. Yeah, because, I mean, right now they are producing and broadcasting in-house. Like Seminole Productions handles the baseball games and the softball games. It's not... ACC, I think he ESPN's. means like the ACC just has its own channel. Yeah. Like that, it does and keeps everything. ESPN's not even involved. It's just ACC. It's just an ACC channel. Right. I'm saying, but all this infrastructure, I think ESPN went a little bit in on. I don't think they made oh, all maybe. the universities like, all right, you guys are going to have to pay all your staff. And I mean, now granted, they don't pay, uh, you know, these 19 year old kids as much money as ABC or Fox is paying the guys right. that are doing Sunday NFL football, but. Uh, that's neither here nor there. But, yeah, I mean, I guess there's a certain point where you want to take control of your product and then why provide ESPN that uh, bridge. But, listen, they, they've got a really loud megaphone, so they do promote the heck out of your product. I don't know. Uh, this could be something that happens, but you're, you're going to be ahead of the curve, Robert, for sure. I just don't think it's going to happen here in the next, I don't know, five years. But who am I? And what's five years? Time. Yeah. Yeah. Is it infinite? Time flies. Yep. Um, our guy Mark in Naples has a lot to say about Brooks Kepka. If you're a member, go check out what he says. Um, 
Well, I mean, I feel bad. He's like, Aslan, I'll go ahead and provide a golfer's and business perspective on Kepka's win. No, I got it. Yeah, don't, you, yeah, I was just laughing. That was funny. He actually texted me uh, his thoughts on Brooks Kepka. So yeah. I've already I've already seen them. All right. Uh, I'll try to sum it up here so we don't go too long today. Uh, Brooks's golf comeback should be celebrated. Probably not like Tiger 2019, but to me, it's in the same discussion. A year ago, he wasn't even sure he would play in a major again, let alone contend. Uh, as far as the golf part, look at his body language, his approach every shot. When he's dialed in, nothing fazed him. Watch how he sets up to a shot, takes a final look, gives it a go. I call it a full send. If I could give one piece of advice to golfers out there, watch Brooks. I don't care what your swing looks like or how far you hit it. Get up to the shot. Quickly imagine a train track going through your club, body in the golf ball. One quick final look at the target. Give it a full send. As far as live. I know for a fact most guys on tour don't give a crap who plays in what events. It's a personal decision for these guys, and they are all professionals. Uh, he does not get world ranking points for his live finishes. He would officially be ranked probably one or two in the world right now, given his recent finishes in the majors. If the media had to vote for world rankings without affiliation, he probably would still be one or two in the world as well, uh, even next to Rom probably. Everybody knows it. So uh, the PGA Tour, as wonderful as it is, should not dictate who the best players are and who gets to play where based on a monopolized point system. Also, so he says just Brooks, sum that up, or it seems like you just read the whole thing. No, I mean, there's there's some more in there. Okay, also, he right. says Brooks will be a factor in the British and U.S. Opens. I would think, man, he's going to be a factor in everything. The cool thing about Brooks is, man, literally that guy, uh, who was he playing with? Hovland. Yes. It took him three or four minutes to get out of that crazy bunker situation. Oh, my gosh, where he the drop. It. I know, they're like... Bringing all different clubs, different yeah, angles. But like just as soon as his ball landed in the fairway and was rolling, yeah. they flashed to Brooks Kepka in his backswing. Yeah. Like Brooks Kepka was just like, okay, man, yeah, all right, he, oh, you hit it, okay, I'm ready to go, and he, he was hitting it as they switched to him. And that's the thing about Kepka, man. He's always played fast and complained about slow players, but man, the conviction to be like, okay, there's not a lot of time. I don't have to think about this. I, I practice a lot. It's my turn to hit. I know the club I'm hitting. I know where I'm aiming. Here's my swing. And then I'm going to walk up and do it again. It was just uh, – he did that with a crazy bunker shot he had on that hole. And, and one of those holes where it was an unbelievably nasty lie. And he just went up there and smacked it. I just – that's I love the way he plays uh, in that regard. DB Chief, wake up, gentlemen. I'm looking at the schedule for the upcoming season. feel like the pit game is a potential trap. Late in the season, potential nagging injuries piling up, following an emotional game where we get revenge against Wake, possibly <laughs> looking ahead to Miami, weather, November, Pittsburgh. Feel like this could be the one game we should win but could lose. What say you? Thanks for everything you do. All those are very good uh, observations. They're, they're uh, well thought out. I agree with them. Uh, it, is, it could be a trap game because you know I'm, I'm aiming for Wake. Uh, so if you do uh, finally beat those guys and beat them, beat the brakes off them, hopefully um, you, you have the Miami the next week. Pitt is always a good team. I shouldn't say a good team. Pitt is always a competent team. Yes. And if you play poorly, they will take advantage and beat you. You have better players than they do, but they beat a lot of teams that have better players than them. Um, they are not going to beat themselves. Typically they're going to be, they're going to try to run the ball. That's what they do. And if you can't stop it, or if you don't like playing in the cold and it's 26 degrees and snowy, which it shouldn't be by that time, but who knows? November uh, yeah, 4th, it, November it could, 4th. Yeah. It's not, no, it's not December 30th, but yeah. uh, it could be, it could be not great conditions. And yeah, that's certainly a recipe to get upset, but all of that, the caveat, the qualifier to all of that is we have no idea if Pitt's going to be any good at all. What if Pitt's two and eight? Like that's the beauty of this conference, man. Team could win the championship one year or contend for it. And then literally you're not sure if they'll win three games the following year, except for the team that wears orange. You always know they're going to be good. And hopefully we're back to the point where the team that wears garnet, you always know they're going to be good, but everybody else, who knows? L literally who knows Aslan? Yeah. What's the one team you can count on. That's always going to be pretty good. NC state. Maybe since Doran got there. Yeah, but like you would not be stunned team, right? if they went four and eight next year. No, no, no. That's just what the ACC does. I mean, they're going to go with Phil Dracovic as their quarterback right Come now. Get some, Phil. I don't. I'm not too worried about that. I mean, he, well, we'll see. He might have a great season, Aslan. You'll know. I mean, Maybe he's got better players around him. I don't know. He had Zay Flowers at Boston College. The guy was like a first round pick, wasn't he? Whatever, whatever. Um, Quit bringing up old stuff. <laughs> I thought Duke, like Duke was my trap game, but Duke is at home and is coming off Syracuse. 
but maybe yeah. you're looking ahead to Wake Forest. So I'll say that. Man, where are we in our lives oh. where you have to worry about overlooking Duke because Wake Forest is on the schedule? Yeah. No, they're going to – I mean, and watch the pit game will be sunny and 52 degrees or something yeah. like that. Like, the only thing I'm worried about, like, we do sound really arrogant and cocky. Um, but, like, they've got – to your point, like, they've got these proven pieces on offense. The thing I was thinking about the gym the other day for some reason was Mike Norvell – what exercise were you doing? Uh, I was doing box jumps. Oh, okay, to, uh, nice. You think in the middle of box jumps? Or are you oh, taking between, a break in, in between, between Yeah, sets. in between I sets. Because gotcha. I'm just like, man, this team's really good. Like, where am I going to be? Am Because my buddy, is he's coming down for Memorial Day. I don't know if I'm going to go see him. He lives in Pittsburgh. I'm like, I'll see him when I'm up in Pittsburgh. Because Florida State's going to be on the path to a playoff. And, right, um, right. I'll have to be up there to cover that. But, I mean, we're at the point where the only thing, because you know, there's going to be something that could maybe slow this team down, or maybe they will be 2013. Maybe it'll just be an absolute juggernaut. But like, the only thing that could stop them is like if Norvell loses his touch calling plays. Like, are, are we giving him too much? Like, are we not factoring in the human element of this at all? Of just 20 year old kids, maybe a little, not even so much banged up, but feeling really good week eight, playing a team that you know is on a three game losing streak. Mike has maybe a few bad play calls and then all of a sudden we're in a game that we have no business being in or again do we just lean back on the fact that we just believe with pretty good evidence that we're are just so more supremely talented than everybody on this schedule that you know even if we regress to the mean we're still going to be all right you know i was uh i was thinking about that too i wasn't doing box jumps but it was about you know the addition of keon coleman and how that's that really has changed my perception of the season my my the way I view what this season can be, because I think, you know, what if Johnny was having one of his games where he dropped three or four passes um, or you couldn't run the ball or if Johnny had a bad ankle or something or if Travis was just a little bit off like that's those were the recipes, I thought, where Florida State against a team that they're favored by double digits could lose a game or be in a game in the fourth quarter uh, uh, in a game that you should be, you know, Jordan Travis should be wearing a cap on the sideline. He's actually having to play and, and put away a game. But then Keon Coleman's addition, I just think even if this offense plays a B minus level, doesn't play a plus, isn't incredible, just kind of sputters around a little bit for it. You're still, I think anywhere from 30 to 35 points against almost everybody on your schedule. And if you've got 34 points on the road in Pittsburgh, you're going to probably win that game, and it should be comfortable. You know what I mean? Like, I don't the, – the the chances to be upset or knocked off, there has to go – the margin for error is so much bigger now, I think, mm-hmm. because you do have two freaks on the outside that you can just throw it up to, and they can just go make plays that you can't coach, even if the play calling, if he's having a rough day are not seeing it as well as, as he normally does. You still have some freaks that just go make plays. Jaheim Bell's a freak. Trey Brent Benson is too. Like, these guys can get you out of bad calls. And you got a quarterback that's almost probably as good as almost anybody in the country. And if the pr- protection breaks down because your offensive lineman misses a block, he can still make a play out of that. That's what gives me um, the confidence that they will avoid, like, a, 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 a catastrophic upset. The defense is not going to be incredible. It doesn't have to be. But the defense is not going to be awful, which is the key. The defense will be, in my opinion, will be somewhere top 25, top 30-ish, top three in the conference. And that should be good enough with that kind of offense to avoid any major upsets. Which is what they were last year, right? And if yeah. the offense doesn't sputter... And they avoided every upset, right? Yeah. You know, they were, uh, they, and again, they were, they're going to be, the, the spreads will be bigger this year, but they lost to, I mean, I guess you could say NC State was an upset or Wake because Florida State was favored in that game, but um, that was, I think, again, I guess I think the addition of Keon Coleman avoids a Wake Forest game. Like, you might lose to Wake, but you're not going to score 20 points. You're not going to go essentially two whole quarters without scoring a point. I just think the same thing with NC State. They went the whole second half without scoring. I think those days are over. I think Keon Coleman and the improvement and the addition of Jaheim Bell and this offensive line will make that almost, almost impossible to happen as long as they're relatively healthy. And I should have brought this up earlier, circling back, and then we'll move on. Whoever was asking about whether or not we have concerns, maybe it was WAC 1169 or something like that, concerns uh, if there's going to be enough football to go around for everybody to keep everybody happy. I 
I think it was Jaheim Bell who tweeted something like, "Y'all are y'all can't double anybody anymore. You're gonna have you to can't play. double everyone." Yeah, yeah. When when Keon Coleman committed, he's like, yeah. "Well, you can't double everyone." Yeah. So they, I think players like that appreciate a Keon Coleman on the outside, and I think Keon Coleman appreciates Jaheim Bell. You know, like uh, what what they do for each other and how, okay, yeah, man, if you want to double Jaheim Bell in the middle of the field or bracket him, well, good. That's a quarter one-on-one with Keon Coleman and jo- or Johnny Wilson. Good luck, man. Good luck. Hope he drops it because he's going to get it thrown to him and he's going to be in position to make a 30 or 40-yard catch. And same thing if they double, if they have the safety going over the top to help out with Coleman or Wilson. Well, Jaheim Bell's in the middle of the field with somebody that he's much bigger than and probably more athletic than. So good luck there. It's a yeah. good place to be in. If, if this if this season were to not go as planned as it was like a sitcom, it, there would be a scene about all these guys texting like their best friend, like Johnny texting his best friend, like, man, we got that Keon guy. Like no one's going to be able to double team me now. I'm going to eat. And then Jaheim Bell texts his best friend, like, we just got that Keon Coleman guy. No one can double team us now. I'm going to eat. And then they end up having 26 catches each. And yeah. they're like, well, you know, I thought I was going to be the one that was going to get 54 catches because of this. But hopefully they've all done the math, to your point. They realized that, like, look last year. They were hanging 40 in the last six weeks of the season, and they were shutting it down third quarter. Right. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere over at mybookie.ag and use the promo code WARCHANT when you sign up. You will get an instant cash deposit bonus which means you get more money to play with more money to win hopefully everybody nba playoffs winding down here now r.i.p lakers r.i.p lake show bring back austin reeves so we're just going to go with uh, futures futures ncaa division one fbs championship florida state now plus 1975 so if you got on it the other day at plus 1875 sorry didn't realize they were so mercurial over there. If you put $100 down on Florida State right now over at mybookie.ag and they win the national title, think about how awesome that will be, right? First off, like amazing, right? Fourth title, let's go. You'd win $1,975 from just a $100 bet. I'm going to put another zero in there. Let's not get too crazy, though. If you put $1,000 down and they won it all, $19,750. You could pay for your entire trip. You could pay probably for the playoff trip. The national championship game itself, you'd be able to pay for all of it if you put $1,000 on, but they'd have to win it. They'd have to win it, though. And there's 132 other teams vying for it, so it's tough. Bet responsibly, please. This is all for fun. But go to mybookie.ag. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, including the ponies when they go to the Belmont here in a few weeks, I think. Live casino, sports book. Hit it up, mybookie.ag. Use the promo code WARCHANT. The Walking Nolo One. What's up, you two? Shout out to Brooks for winning the PGA. That was awesome to watch. So what is it going to take from the baseball program to ease the pain of breaking our 44-season postseason streak? A national championship, right? Either way, glad they ended on a good note. Excited to see what we can do next year. Thanks for all you do. Supers. Just make do. Maybe that sounds even overly ambitious after you didn't even make it to your conference tournament because you were not one of the 12 best teams in said conference, you 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 got to go to a super like that's that's the that's the error in the '90s that w- is what really has defined this program forever now. Like we right. thought the nine, it's just the '90s was the way it was. It was always going to be that way. Get back there, just get back there. Like supers were the absolute floor to your season back then. So do that. Be one of the last sixteen standing. I'm good. I'm looking it up right now. I'm trying to figure out the last time Florida State hosted a super regional. Well, it was accidentally in seventeen because Sam Houston State upset whoever in the regionals, and then they came to Tallahassee uh, when they went out. Oh, there. Oh, right. So then lost. eighteen, they didn't. They went no. So when they went to LA, when oh they, no Mike, eighteen, Mike they lost. Last year, they, they went, went to Baton two. Rouge. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking of eighteen. They yeah, lost. No, so they that was Drew they Parrish, a that was Drew Parrish rain delay yeah. game. Yeah, I remember that now, and then I'm looking at that. So, yeah, so the last time they earned, kind of earned it where they got to host. <laughs> earned it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, that yeah, they yeah, got no, to. Yeah. I mean, thirteen, probably. Or no, yeah, because fourteen they would. They were a top national seed, and they got zero and two in their own regional. Yeah. And then, yeah, so it was probably thirteen against Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. So you've hosted one super regional in a decade. 
Well, I'm not saying host. I think that's no, being I top am. eight. Oh, top I, eight I national seed. Let's go. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, that's where you get back. Because, look, man, get to a top eight national seed, and anything can happen. We all know baseball's goofy. You are bound to win one of these things. But I want, like, you know, it's been one time, in the, and it just uh, watching the softball team got me thinking because the softball team – is always hosting regionals and super regionals. And even the last two times that Florida State made it out to Omaha was kind of by, you know, 19 was just straight up smoke and mirrors and just one crazy run, magical run. And then 17, they got lucky that, in my opinion, they got lucky. Sam Houston State was a fine team. But they got lucky that Sam Houston State upset whoever they did, Oklahoma State or somebody, because I don't think that team in 17 was going to go on the road in the supers and win two out of three. So, man, just get back to mattering again. And so it's been, a, I mean, yeah, man, Florida State made the tournament the last two years under meet, but did they re, I mean, they were a three seed both years or a three and a two who can even matter. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, yeah. who can remember, but get back to being in the conversation for being a, a top eight national seed. Okay. And I want to see Hauser look mm-hmm. like Hauser again. Yes. That would be cool to see. Awesome. So that's what I want to see. Omaha will come. You, you you get to the, you get to supers enough. Omaha will eventually come, and we know Link can get there. So just make this make Hauser matter in June again. Yeah. XDQ 4 way up, Aslan. Welcome to the All In on Destin Hill fan club. I am the acting president. I believe nice. he's going to factor heavily into our plans once we get to the end of the year. I believe he will be the reason we beat Florida. Oh. All right, mark that okay. down in the pod, Derek. Circle it. Let us know late November. Question. Which is more likely in 2023? He's very, very uh, graceful here. He says that we can have multiple answers and a more likely, but I'm going to only pick one. Here we go. Ready, Corey? Okay, let's do it. Which is more likely? Jordan Travis passes for 4,000 yards or more. Trey Benson runs for 1,250 yards or more. Johnny Keon Jaheim combined for 2,000 yards receiving. Verse and Peyton combined for 20 sacks. Oh, oh, those the, are good, uh, Derek. The the receiving one. I was going to say either that or Verse and Peyton. Man, I, I think, think Verse the, is going to got like he's going to have like 13, 14 minimum, and then Patrick Payne's got to get seven. But I think the receiving one almost happened last year. Like Johnny had what 900, 800. Coleman had 800. Well, that's 16 right there. And you got to imagine both those will have similar numbers. And then Bell, Bell, I think Bell can average 30 yards a game receiving or 40 yards a game receiving. Trying to look. You're, you're right. Let me pull it up here for, for – not that I doubt But you 20 so sacks with Verse and Peyton's not a bad number either because you're right. If Verse has 12, Peyton – I mean, you think Peyton can get to seven or eight. Yeah. He could be right there in that mix, yeah. Well, They're all good th- numbers, and Jordan Travis can definitely pass for 4,000 yards too. Can you look, though, at Keon Coleman in Michigan State? I know he'll be in a better offense, but he will not be nearly as featured. So, I mean, is that – are we using that as the barometer for what he's going to do, or do we look at how successful Florida State's offense was last year and we look at their second leading receiver had 495 yards? Who was their second leading receiver? Pokey. So in, terms of, m- in terms of raw yard, in terms of how yards. How much did Johnny have? 897, so 900. So that, between them, that's... 1,400 yards. 1,400 yards. Micah and then how had much 330. Did, he was the number three receiver. How many did McDonald have? 312. So the three, the, the number one tight end and the two top receivers combined for 1,700 yards last year. I don't think going up 30 yards a game for your top three trio is is crazy. Okay. You know, I think that'll happen. I think, I think Johnny's going to get to 1,000 if he's healthy. Maybe Coleman gets to a thousand too, but if he, even if he's at like six fifty, I think Jaheim Bell Jaheim Bell is going to catch more than three hundred and twelve yards, which is what Cam McDonald had. So yeah, yeah. well said. I'm still going with Jared and Patrick. Okay, there that's a good answer. They're uh, all hey, they're all doable. Yeah, it wouldn't be crazy if Benson had twelve hundred. Yeah. Uh, last two Island right, Chief wake up. Seems to me that the potential for the offensive line to win their battles this season is appreciable. The competition they will face daily in practice against our defensive line should identify those who can help us win. Iron doing what it does to iron. Well, well said. That's that should be a T-shirt. Yeah. Iron's going to do what it does. But who are the next two offensive linemen drafted? The next five? Question mark. Uh, Jeremiah Byers 
and uh, I guess Rob Scott, man. I know he got hurt. It was cra- He was like mocked in some crazy stuff. Is uh, the question who's going to be the, which of those guys will be drafted by the NFL? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure not the CFL. Yeah, I think Rob Scott will play in the NFL. Don't you? Yeah, but who's the next two? Like, would would Meech go ahead of him? Um, no, I think I if Meech Casey was going to go ahead of him, he wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. That's, I guess that's a really good point. But then people might say, well, about Bless Harris. Bless Harris had a really good spring. Uh, yeah. The next five. All right, so Byers Scott, I think Demetri Manuel will get drafted. Casey Roddick? Like, I love Maurice, but I don't know. Like, I love Maurice, but I don't know, man. Um, yeah, I mean, you say, look, I, I would be surprised if Maurice got drafted because of the size thing. Yeah. Uh, but that does not mean he can't be a quality college football offensive lineman. Has already proven to be. Um, yeah, man. I, yeah, maybe. So then maybe. I guess everyone's yelling at us to say Julian Armella. So I guess yeah. we can say Julian Armella. Yeah, I mean, he moves well for that size. We have not seen it enough to say he's definitely an NFL player, but he certainly has the frame to project that way. All right, last one. Wartown Knoll. Asked a few questions before the move to on three. Parenthetically, he adds, or she adds, which is great, B2W. Mm. My handle was Bry Guy is one, which got Aslan a little miffed, it seemed. I don't remember this, but all right. Anyways, because I am new but not new, here are a few notables not named Ron Simmons, Jake Fromm, or Willie Reed. Cal Daniels, Betty Cantrell, Eddie Anderson, James Brooks. From uh, from Warner Robins. Yeah. Oh, Wartown. But is it called Wartown short for Warner? Because aren't there isn't there like a military installation out there? I don't or know. I, I've it's never close. heard anybody call it Wartown, but I've never lived there, so uh. I just called it Warner Robins. Right. The house, the 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 city that Ron Simmons built. Mm. I am curious. I should have actually bundled this earlier. I apologize. I am curious how FSU will be officiated this year. LOL. Do you think because of the GOR fiasco, FSU will be even more so, in all caps, even more so hated by the referees and the ACC? Or do you think the ACC and the referees understand that FSU presents a great opportunity for the ACC and will be a kinder, gentler officiating squad? Definitely not the left. (laughs) This is hands down the best FSU podcast out there, and it's because of you both. Thanks. Go Knowles. Thanks, Brad Guy. Appreciate yeah, thank you. I, I've kind of thought about that, like not necessarily this year, because look, man, it's just noise in May. Uh, I don't know that anybody officiating the game in October is going to even remember that. But they're going to be uh, told, bro. Like they're going to be told. See, I've... and they won't. And I do not think they will be told. Okay. I do. I do. My conspiracy theory only runs to a certain level. I, I don't okay. think anybody in the ACC is going to be actively telling referees to screw Florida State because okay. uh, you don't leave a paper trail. And you never know who's recording you anymore, guys. Trust me. I'm speaking from experience. Somebody might have their phone on when you're just having a conversation at a bar. You know what I mean? Actually, I don't really have happened? any experience doing that, right, but that well, does, I'm sure that does happen. I thought it was going to be another episode. <laughs> no, it had no, no. Actually, that hasn't happened to me. But uh, so I don't. I don't think there's going to be a conspiracy theory going there. But I look, man. It, nothing has really changed in the last 30 years when it comes to Florida State and the officiating. So. They are not going to get the, – the, the equivalent I always brought up was Duke and North Carolina in basketball getting the calls. They, they will not get the calls that the really good teams get, but I don't think they're going to be punished. I don't think there will be any extra punishment because of what's going on with the GOR. Um, I just think it's it will it'll remain incompetent. We might have to worry about us, us war chant. We might get like really bad seats mm. when it comes to media, like seating at these places. Like Jim Phillips and I'd be like, yeah, put them in the corner. Like, yeah, that's give that, true. That's a good point. Give that kid with the beard, give the give that guy with the bad hair and the beard, give him pork. Make sure there's pork in his dinner. Mm. There you go. Um, there, there's a conspiracy I can get behind. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought about that, but uh well, here's the thing. Clemson is kind of in the same boat with us. So if it now yeah. listen, if it's us and Clemson and Charlotte, cool, right? Like don't uh, even have officials. <laughs> Call your own fouls. Call your own penalties. But if like Mac Brown, old loyal Mac Brown in Carolina, yeah. and us, then maybe at that point we get uh, we get shivved. 
Um, so who yeah, knows? but I, I guess what I was going back to is like if and when it happens where this is Florida State's last year in the ACC, yeah, then, yeah. I mean, look out. It, okay. it could get ugly. Um, but I, I think until then, I don't think there'll be any. Uh, I know, but don't know. don't they want to neuter us now so we don't even think about leaving? I but then that applies to the conspiracy and Phillips talking to these officials, and I just okay. don't think that happens. Okay. Okay. All right. I think the officials will do it on their own once Florida State is actually on their way out. Like I'm very curious about Texas and Oklahoma games this year yeah. in the Big Twelve. Yeah. Since they're leaving for the SEC after this year, I want to see what those look like when Oklahoma's playing Oklahoma State or Texas is playing TCU. That'll be a good litmus test for what Florida State and Clemson will go through. Uh, indeed, indeed. Well said. All right, that's a wrap for us, everybody. We'll be back 6 p.m. live on YouTube taking your questions. Uh, so that'll be fun. Come out. Hang out with us. Uh, don't forget, also, again, Super Regionals, Florida State hosting Georgia, Thursday, 7 o'clock, Friday, 8 p.m., and then, if necessary, Saturday. So we'll be live at 6 o'clock. That'll be your Thursday podcast. Corey, I might have to steal you. And, and do something for Friday as well because okay. All right. um, we just kind of breeze through the mailbag. Didn't feel like we needed to stretch that into two. No, nope, um, no, that was fine. So it felt it was good. It wasn't good. even an hour. We did yeah. it, man. So uh, stay connected. Subscribe to the podcast, everybody. Somebody said it's the best podcast, so just do it for them. And then you can always know what's going on. It drops right into your phone. Hit the thumbs up on the way out. We'd appreciate that if you're on YouTube. He's Corey. I'm Aslan. Thanks for listening to the Wake Up War Champ podcast presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Jeff Cameron Show coming up 1 to 3 o'clock.